Welcome back to Goldmark TV. We've got two fantastic artists to showcase for you today. Uh, first, we'll be looking at the beautiful collage works of, of Francis Davison. He's a fantastic, underrated, abstract artist. And then I'll be having a chat with uh, Potter Phil Rogers, whose show we've, been, we've uh, uh, had open since Saturday. Just a few days it's been open and already over 100 pots have sold. Uh, you might have seen on Monday, uh, Phil spoke with uh, the Reverend Richard Coles uh, for a fantastic conversation. If you've uh, not seen that yet, go and watch that after this broadcast. Um, for now, we're going to have a look at some of the, the, the wonderful pots that we didn't manage to showcase in our exhibition walkthrough. I hope you enjoy. I've always loved the work of Francis Davison, but I don't really know if I can articulate why. He should have gone down as one of the most important abstract artists in, in British art for the last hundred years, but his reputation has sort of been forgotten. This is a wonderful late Davison collage, and you can see the elements of the real world around him that he used uh, in these abstract collages the furrows of fields, the hedgerows in the Suffolk countryside around him. He was a purist when it came to paper. He used only found pieces, cut and torn and never painted. And at his only major show in his life, just a year before his death in 1984, he insisted that the work be hung unattributed, untitled and without description. His tremendous shyness seeps into his collages. And it's only with time that they start to reward with these hidden resonances. Davison was a, a young student of English at the Cambridge University and he'd actually initially intended to become a poet but in 1946 he was introduced to the group of artists working in St Ives by his fellow classmate and, and abstract artist Patrick Heron. The commune of, of artists to whom he was introduced at St Ives had really almost grown by accident. The artist Margaret Mellis and her husband Adrian Stokes had invited Ben Nicholson and Barbara Hepworth and their three young children to stay with them uh, throughout the Second World War. They developed a, a kind of uh, abstract language that drew much on the, on the landscape around them and interior scenes, reducing what they saw to sort of plain blocks of, uh, and, 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 and sort of vistas of, of colour. At the time, Davison was going through a, a, a messy end to his marriage and Margaret Mellis was separating from Adrian Stokes. It was in St Ives that they first met, that they fell in love, and that Mellis first started to teach Davison how to paint. Soon after they met, Mellis and Davison married. They spent their honeymoon in Venice, where they painted the gondolas from their balconies, and then they spent a year in Cap Antibes with Patrick Heron. Davison and Heron would wander around the cliffs. They went and met Matisse, who was then ailing, 
and they went to the, uh, the cliff tops and found the rocks where he'd painted views of the, the Mediterranean Sea out uh, in front of him and the rocks where the paint had been mixed on the sides of the cliffs. He went on honeymoon with Margaret to Venice and they both painted considerably there. Um, you'll see in one or two of these Venetian pictures the same balcony reappearing time and time again. His colours at this stage are very bright, very sun-related, and one could almost say that they could well have influenced some of Patrick Heron's later colour scents rather than the other way around. I do, I do think that these, these eyes in the front of the boat are particularly interesting, and later on in, with the collages, uh, he used the idea of breaking up a form with uh, sticking another piece of paper in the middle of that form. Just taking that idea that you can break a form up with a smaller form was a very important part of the actual development of the collage. After the honeymoon, Davison and Mellis went to live in the south of France and he continued to paint at Cap d'Antibes and a number of these of yachts, lighthouses and almost tropical foliage um, show the same strong colours that he was using in Venice. He's now decided, in a way, I'm not going to represent, in this, I'm using these shapes but I'm also going to use colour in an abstract kind of way. And so the colour is extended. It is, it is, uh, in the same way as when he started to use collage paper, he managed to get the best he could get out of that, that, uh, the colour of the paper. There are splashes of colour that reappear very occasionally. There's a little oil called Colourful Cottage, which suddenly sings out with those south of France colours. Um, but it, it's actually set in Suffolk in those early years and is a counterbalance to the muted forms that he's normally producing at that time. In 1950, the Davisons returned to England where they bought a rundown cottage in Suffolk, the only house they could afford. Almost immediately, Davison's sympathetic palette changed. The calico greys and greens, paper bag browns uh, and chocolate shades of, of, of uh, torn paper and cardboard quickly supplanted the beautiful bright shades of Matisse and the Mediterranean. His sense of form began to change too, as the farmhouses, the fields, uh, the boats in nearby harbour started to, to influence uh, his approach to, to the flat plane of the canvas. And in 1952, the same year that this collage was made, he turned his thoughts solely towards paper. Right, in here, this is where Francis used to work. He would usually pin up the collage that he was working on on that wall here. And there was a, a bed where all the collages he was working on would be in this corner here. And then the books, uh, basically his collection of books. There's also some more books downstairs. But one of the ways we could identify which way up the collages were was just looking for the drawing pin holes. Um, because he would never, he would absolutely never um, want to tell anybody which way up it was, you know, anything, any history. It was an attempt to sort of <laughs> present that particular thing in a particular kind of way for itself, you know. With the move from paint to paper came concerns about the juxtaposition of textures and lines and building up forms in a way that he hadn't been able to do with paint. Collage had its benefits too. Paper was cheaper than oils and the compositions could be stored more easily both before and after assembly. His compositions could be realised more quickly too, moving the scraps of paper around at will until he was happy with the final image. When Davison first started making collages, the colours he used had that sort of they still picked up the grey, the black, the brown, the beige, the tones almost of wartime. And again, probably the tones of a damp, wet East Anglia. These earlier collages are often smaller 
uh, more subtle in their colours, uh, limited as he was in the, term, in the types of paper that he could source. They're typified by this sort of rather lovely palette of uh, the natural tones of pulp and paper, the mustards, the little flecks of colour, and then the occasional foray into something a little sweeter, like this pink in here. With time, he grew more confident in size and scope. And over the next 30 years, that palette of mustards and browns and drab greys would expand, absorbing all kinds of different colours. And those miniature paper patchworks would grow to great, vast, expressive, expansive six-foot collages. did discover these different coloured papers that really, really, uh, it was, it, you can really see it in the collage. And, I, th and I, I really do think that he really liked working with paper because he felt he could manipulate it, he could make it sculptural, he could do all these different things that he felt he probably couldn't have done if he was working with a brush. But it's really the way he just juxtaposed those shapes and colours that sing and bring out the glory and the joy and the vivacity and the sort of verve of the later collages. The habit of tearing pieces of collage off and re-sticking them and moving them around and leaving the torn areas as part of the finished collage was all part of the balance of the image he wanted to pre present. They, they were uh, bits, the bits of paper came away uh, from the other bits of paper on purpose. Uh, so that they, they, st they stood out and there was a shadow. Um, and he was playing with that. He was playing with a dimensional thing related to the paper, the colour of the paper, and a little bit of physicality like in that place there. Though with these sort of feathered and torn edges, they seem haphazard, Davison's collages were put together with extreme precision and care. It's the little hidden details that you won't notice uh, on first sight, but which you find and explore the more you, time you spend with a, with a Davison collage, which really make it. The little hidden tongues of paper that stick out, the, the layerings and shadows, the tiniest scraps of paper that have been glued and peeled back to leave the faintest scar of a brighter colour in this sort of beautiful muted tones. Part of the success of Davison's use of colour was that he knew exactly how to balance tones, how to balance the qualities of light and dark across different colours. And in a beautiful piece like this, with these muted pinks, oranges, uh, chocolate browns and greens, offset by this beautiful stark white, you get a real feel for how, even though he was now working with paper and not paint, colour was always in his mind. What keeps your interest with the Davison collage and what he had intended is that there's always something to be found there. It's not purely abstract. There is always a sense of the world around him. In something like this piece with these multiple pieces of paper mapping out these, these lines like hedgerows, uh, it's almost sort of cartographic, like a, like a map. You get a real feeling for the, the countryside with which Mellis and Davison surrounded themselves the sort of edges of fields and farmlands, the delineations between uh, those areas that come out in these lines and blocks of colour. Like the farmland and the natural landscape around them, it is both ordered and loose at the same time. It's both arranged and has a life of its own spilling around with these different textures and colours coming through. It's really down to the, the collage to express everything he wanted to say without him having to give it a title and explain it to anybody. And he was happy for the person looking at it to read into it what they wanted to see. I mean, he once made the comment, it's not so much you're looking at the collage as the fact that it's actually looking at you. It's a little bit paranoid. He, he didn't feel there was anything in the activity of doing it that was conscious. It was a completely unconscious process. I mean, at the very end, when he was ill, he, he, Margaret was trying to sort of help him. And she said, she said it's absolutely extraordinary, because he was saying, tear it out. Um, and she would do what he asked to do, and he'd say, no, no, that's useless. 
He was actually very, very difficult. And, uh, he, and um, as he couldn't do it because his hands were shaking, um, it was very difficult for her to do. But she did, she did try very hard. She was very good. And he, he would accept at the very end. But these were like, like little pieces of paper about that big, which had to be... And the actual dedication to how it should be torn had been so developed at that point that virtually getting... There was no way of instructing somebody. They, had, they didn't have that history of doing it like he did. Davison had only one major show during his lifetime. That was at the Hayward Gallery in 1983. A year later, he died, leaving his estate almost completely intact with very few paintings and, and collages sold. His desire for anonymity in that exhibition had probably come at a price. And it was some years before his contribution to post-war abstraction has really been properly understood. The, the Hayward show was really the culmination of Davison's work, insofar as it happened a year before he died, um, um, was the first time he'd had been in a really public exhibition space as opposed to a, a, a commercial gallery space. That was an amazing strain. I mean, I think doing any kind of show of his work was horrendous for him to do. He couldn't really make that transition of being a in the public or putting the work in the public. It had become such a private activity. There was one result of that show at the Hayward, which was that Damon Hirst saw it. And that was before Damon Hirst was known as, da as we know Damon Hirst. And he was blown away, as he put it. But um, that was such a chance thing. And that's how the connection between Margaret and Damon coming down for a weekend occurred, because he then found out that Francis had subsequently died and he still wanted to see um, the work. Though he had abandoned the indulgence of paint for more than 30 years, Davison remained a master of colour throughout his career. In fact, at the Hayward exhibition and in other compositions that he put together, he always insisted that they be shown with these rather dull grey, green and brown backgrounds rather than stark white, which he thought would kill the interrelation between these soft colours throughout the paper. This is a very moving experience for me to be uh, in this beautiful Goldmark Gallery uh, looking at Francis Davison's work because I knew him very well uh, towards the end of his life before he died of cancer and uh, uh, I looked at all his work he, he wanted me to see everything he'd done as he, when he knew he was dying and he used to go down at weekends and uh, he'd say is this any good and if I, if I if I didn't nod, he tended to tear it up, <laughs> so or burn it. So it was a it was a difficult time. I saw uh, the whole beginning of his work right the way through, uh, and he only wanted the best surviving. It's the harmonic effect, the the balance of the colours and the shapes that have no defining outside limits, but spread themselves out across the board and just create their own total harmony. If Davison as a fairly introverted character had not retreated to the edge of East Anglia, but had spent a lot more time in London and the West Country, St Ives really being his natural artistic home, it seems highly probable that he would now be at the forefront of European art history there is something inexpressibly special about Francis Davison's work. And it's something that takes a long time to come to terms with and to recognise. Somehow, in a career of maybe 30 or 40 years, he managed to find in these collages a way of reconciling all those contrasts that artists are looking for, of strength and serenity, of calmness, and of busyness. I find that even in the most textured, the most expansive, the most lush of all his works in, in collage, there is a stillness. And it's a stillness that demands time from the viewer. It can take a long time to get used to Davidson's work, to come to terms with what it's trying to tell us about the world. But it's in precisely that time, in that slowness, that we find ourselves 
discovering the world through his eyes. I think all great art is in some way a discovery. And Francis Davison built a career, a, a, a career that's gone unremembered and forgotten on endless discovery through paper. I hope you've enjoyed seeing some of his work here today. And I hope this is an artist that you will uh, enjoy discovering more of as we have here at the gallery. Well, thank you for being with us here again, Phil. We're going to be taking a look at a couple of the, the pots we've not had a chance to showcase in the, in the exhibition. Yeah. Um, I was just speaking to, to Toots, actually, um, Vicky, who runs our, our, our pot department, and she said that today we crossed the, the 100 pot mark, um, which oh. is incredible. Um, Brilliant, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I noticed this morning that one of the very big ash glaze wood-fired ones had gone yeah. on the website. So, yeah, no, it's, it's going very well. Mm. So I've got a four or five pots here that we didn't really have time to, to probably um, to show when we, when we did our, our walkthrough and when um, Richard spoke to you the other day. Um, the first I was going to start with is one of these lovely salt glaze pots. We've actually got two, uh, one of which is gracing the, the front cover of the, the catalogue. And here's another. And what I hadn't realised until um, I watched your, your conversation with Richard um, was that you've not been uh, salt glazing for a little while now. No. Um, and I wondered if that was a, is that a, a, has that been a conscious decision? Has that been something that you've had to, is it a matter of time and, and, and resources or? Well, it was really because um, when I built the wood kiln, the wood kiln sort of took over my attention really. And I also, when I built the wood kiln, I built it with two chambers. And the second chamber was meant to be a salt glazed chamber. Right. But it didn't really work very well. I, I fired it four or five times and it didn't get terribly good results. And then after about, I think maybe the sixth firing, I did get some good results. But when I looked at them, I realized that actually they weren't that very much different to what I was getting out of the oil-fired salt kiln. Hmm. And um, of course the wood kiln is such a lot more work. I thought this is crazy and I, I didn't I, after that I changed that second chamber back to a wood fire chamber and um, and then about two years ago I did a couple of firings in the oil fired salt kiln from and that pot you're holding now was from that firing yeah and um, uh, and I haven't fired it again since but it came that firing came within the time frame of when I was collecting pots together for this exhibition. So that's, that's how it is there. I was talking to, to Vicky about them and she said what she, what she really likes about them, what she really appreciates about your, your, the salt glaze pots that you've made is that um, a lot of the, the salt glaze work and the, um, the soda fired work that we, that we deal with is often, um, it's working with, with slips. It's often in that kind of either that dark uh, that dark reddish or dark bluish colour. Mm. Um, she was saying how nice it is to have um, the salt with the ash glaze and, the, and this lovely kind of um, this deep olivey colour, um, which when you're so used to dealing with, with, with salt glaze of a particular kind, it's, it's quite refreshing actually to, to see it like this. Well, there's a, there's a bit of a story to it. Try and make it as brief as I can. Um, some years ago, when Anna Meadow was, uh, was here as an assistant, mm -hmm. we were having a lot of trouble with the salt kiln and we couldn't work out what the problem was. We were getting some awful results, every firing. And um, during the time that it took me to sort it out, to find out what the answer was, um, I found that by putting an ash glaze on the pot, uh, at least it meant that I got a pot out of the kiln that was uh, was okay and was saleable because the slips at that time were not working at all. They were coming out rough and not very nice colours. And I discovered that I actually liked the, the, the effect of the ash glaze in the salt kiln because what happens is the salt is a flux. It makes the glaze melt a little bit more 
So you get those sort of rather runny, um, fluid textures that you get with the ash glazes, mm. heightened by the extra flux of the sodium in the salt. And you can see it on that pot, those rivulets of glaze that, that are created by, by the salt. And, um, and so even after I'd solved the problem, or I'd solved it as much as I could anyway, um, I continued to put ash glaze on quite a lot of the pots because I simply just liked the effect. And I also liked the effect of that sort of, that kind of cool green. I know green is not normally seen as cool, but the green somehow has a coolness to it by comparison to the, um, to the salt glazed areas underneath the glaze, below the glaze, rather. Yes. Um, that contrast of color, I, I, I really like too. There's another pot that I wanted to, to pull out. We had a look at the, when we did the, um, the walkthrough, we had a look at the, the Bunchong pottery and in particular, the Bunchong decoration across some of the, the press molded bottles. I've got one here, which isn't um, Bunchong. This is, this is Max Resist. I just wanted to pick up on this because um, I think you've said before about the press molded work that it was, a lot of it came from a time when you, you wanted to take some time away from the wheel that you were, you were um, dealing with sort of back pains and things. Yeah, and it was, kind a, of, um, it was a nice respite. A bit of back trouble, yeah. Do they still, are they still that kind of respite for you? Do you still go to this work when you get... Mm, not really. I, these days, uh, it's more a case of what do I need to make? What haven't I got? What do I need to, you know, make a, a cross-section of pots for an exhibition like the one we're doing now? And so I know that, uh, you know, I, I have to make so many of each shape from the press mold. Um, and the problem with it is that people hear the word mold and they immediately think, oh, that's not handmade or anything, you know. Yes. And in fact, in the time that it took me to, to press that one, I could have made three on the wheel that size. Yes. You know, it's yeah. not a shortcut, I can tell you. Plus the fact, of course, you have to make the original and then you have to make the plaster mold and that's two or three days work just to do that. But um, to actually press one out takes about 45 to 55 minutes each one. Wow. So it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a shortcut at all. Then once it comes out of the mold, I have to clean it up, clean the seam, the seam marks up. Then I need to throw a neck and attach the neck to it, cut the feet in it. So it's a, it's a time consuming um, work. Certainly um, you can throw them quicker or I can yes. throw them quicker. Yeah. And then there was, there was one question that was, um, that we didn't manage to answer with um, when Rich was talking to you um, that came in just at the end of the last broadcast. And that was about um, this wax resist decoration uh, and how you get the same fluidity with the wax resist as you do with the brushwork in the bone chunk. Because it's, it's obviously, um, it's not an, e an easy medium to get that, that fluidity in. Well, I find I don't use wax. That's the first to say. I use right. latex. Yes. And the big, there are two advantages with latex for me. One is that um, if you use a brush and you fill the brush with the latex, a nice full brush, you can, it helps you to get that sort of fluidity. You can, you can ride the brush over the surface and the latex flows off it nicely. The other big advantage with latex is that if I make a mess of it, which I often do, you can just <laughs> simply pull it off and start again which you right. cannot do with wax. With wax, once you've made a mark, if you make a mess, you have to bisque fire the pot again. Right. Get rid of the wax. With latex, you simply pull it off like rubber and it comes off, leaves the pot clean and you can start all over again. So you can, you can apply the latex with a certain amount of confidence because knowing that you can, you know, you, if you make it a mess, you can start all over. Um, yeah, I, I, as far as the sort of fluidity of the decoration, it's just about having a, um, an attitude in your mind that you just have to do it. And if you make a mess, you, 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 you start again. Yes. With, the, with the brush decoration, with the oxide, I always, nearly always, um, brush the decoration on 
the pot before I put the glaze on. Right. So it's under the glaze. That means that if I make a mess, I can wash it off. If I've already glazed the pot and I make a mess, I have to wash all the glaze off as well. Wow. <laughs> the way I do it is a, the iron oxide goes on first. If I make a mess of it, I can wash it off. The pot is then wet and I have to dry the pot. But that's, that's nothing to worry about too much, really. Um, at least I don't have to re-biscuit fire it, you know. It's interesting with, with pottery from, from a layman's perspective, which I, which I have, often it's the things that you wouldn't, certain things that you don't think about. Like you were mentioning that this, the length of time it takes you to put a, uh, to, to work from the mold, to clean mm. up edges, whatever. It's, um, it's often the things that we wouldn't, you wouldn't notice when you look at a pot that but you're not supposed to. Of time and, 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 <laughs> and technique and, and, uh, and uh, persistence behind them. Yeah, the thing is, you're not supposed to notice. That's why no, we take. No. That's why we take time to clean it all up and get rid of the seam marks. You're not supposed to notice. But whenever I do a demo or a talk, I always make a point at some point of saying how much hard work pottery is and make pots yes. full time. The the amount of effort and that goes into it, you know. And I think a lot of people don't quite realise um how much hard work it is and how much of a potter's life is drudgery you know mixing yeah. glazes mixing clay cleaning the kiln scrubbing the kiln shelves um a lot of it is drudgery and i spend i probably spend less than a quarter of my time actually sitting on the wheel the rest of it is packing a kiln a kiln takes me a week to pack glaze the pots and pack it you know um and the wood kiln, probably eight or nine days to do the two chambers, to glaze everything and put it in. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of drudgery involved, you know, and the, the bits where you're sitting at the wheel, which is my favorite bit, that's probably what well, it is in the minority in, in terms of time spent, yeah. yeah. One of the parts that we particularly looked at when, when uh, Jay and I were walking around filming the, the show, um, were some of these big dishes that you've made. And there was one that I pulled out here, and I hope I pulled it out for the right reason. Because uh, if I'm right, <laughs> this lovely, slightly bluish uh, ash glaze is your elm ash glaze. That's right. Um, which is completely different in, in color and, and, and quality to, to, the, to the pine. Yeah. And as I understand it, there's a, there's a there's, a little story behind the, the elm ash, because obviously we don't have elm uh, around no. us now. No, it's simply that um, one day a, a guy who I know, because we were both on the, um, on the organizing committee for the Aberystwyth Festival years ago, and he was on his way somewhere and came through Redder and he just brought me two sacks of elm ash that had been in the shed in his friend's garden for 30 years. Wow. And um, and I've still got some of it left somewhere. I need to find it because I, the bin is getting very low now. Yeah. Um, but I can remember clearly when I was a teacher, and I'm thinking now maybe it was 1970, probably 74, maybe 75. I can remember clearly going up into the woods in Huntingdon where I lived at that time. And there were huge mounds of wood ash where they'd cut all the elms down and burnt them. Yes. And there were literally mounds of wood ash that were two foot six, three foot high, all through the woods. And I remember collecting some at that point, but in those days, I really didn't have the facilities to do much with it, to be honest. But I wish now that I'd collected an awful lot <laughs> more. But uh, yeah, and the thing is with, with hardwood like elm, <clears throat> you get a totally different color to pine. Pine, pine drags uh, more iron out of the ground right. than the hardwoods. And so you get that more olive green with, the, with pine, and then you get a more bluey, sort of icy green with hardwoods. Oak, oak is a similar color. The problem with oak is it can give you problems in the bucket when it's wet. Well, right. oak is a difficult one, but um, if you make up beech or uh, or even birch or any of those glazes, uh, those woods, you get a similar colour to the to the elm. 
And do you have to be do you have to be careful when you've got when you're working with more than one? Because I know a lot of your parts you've you've got two, often three ash glazes. If you if you've got these nuka pores as well mm. going on at the same time, um, do they affect each other differently? Do you have to be careful with with how you're applying them, or are they quite um, are they are they good companions? Well, they they work well together. The only thing I would do with that particular pot, for instance is I try to keep the line separate between the elm and the pine. I do the inside first with the elm, and then I would probably um, put some wax around the edge so that when I, when I put the pine on, it doesn't go on top of the elm. So you get a, a clear division between the two. Then in other pots, like the bottles, where it has elm ash on the top and pine down the body of the pot, then I quite like it to overlap. And yeah. so you get that sort of gentle movement from the green of the, 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 the lighter green of the elm. It gently moves into the darker glaze below and, and there's a gradation between the, the two glazes. There was one pot in particular that, that stood out to me because it seemed a little different from, from a lot of the others in this, in this show. Mm. And that was this. It's um, uh, I think a wood-fired pot with Chino glaze. Yeah. And it's got this coil, this sort of coil rope decoration all the way around it. Mm. That's Hajong's favourite. I feel like I've not seen, mm. I'm, sh I'm sure, I'm sure you've, you've used it before, but I feel like I've not seen it. And, and I often find with your shows that um, there, will be, there will be sort of companion pieces. There will be pots of, of, a, of a sort of like, uh, a like um, uh, surface decoration or, or like, and then occasionally there are, there are a few who, that seem sort of outliers. They seem like they're, they're on their own. Mm. And I wonder whether, whether um, there are more like that that don't make it into the exhibition. If there are, if there are lots of parts that you know. No, that was, that was a bit of a sort of one off, I suppose. But the idea I made is maybe six or eight pots and there are two or three others in the exhibition where I have faceted the lower third of the pot. Yes. Um, I just thought that was something slightly different to do with the faceting. Yes. And then I just sat that one down and wondered what I could do with the rest of it. And um, that's what came to mind because probably the ropes were sitting on the table next to me as I sat on the wheel. So that was just something I did. I think I I think I might have done another one, a smaller one, but I can't, I can't remember. Most of the ones I did with that faceted bottom third, I made an incised decoration through the top. One, I know there's, there's one in the, in the exhibition, which is Nuka. There's another one, which yes. is Emaku, I think. But that's possibly the only one I did in quite that way. I think it's really um, lovely. I, I like the, um, that slight gold, Lustre that you get with the with the chino, particularly. Yeah, well, it, chino doesn't always do that. It has it has to be in the wood kiln to do that. It, yes. it, it doesn't do that in the oil kiln. And what I what I tend to do is I use a a little bit darker clay than my normal clay clay that I use for the ash. And then I dip the whole part into white slip. And then when the white slip has dried, sometimes after biscuit firing, mm. I then sand the surface of the pot lightly so that the high points of the impressed decoration do not have slip on them anymore. Yes. And those are the bits that burn through the chino to give the pattern. It's Hajong's, that's Hajong's favorite. She liked that pot. <laughs> well, going from Hajong's favorite to my favorite. All right. Uh, I think of all the of all the glazes that you work with, I find that the tamoku really really speaks to me um, mm, mm. more than anything else. There's something about that lovely, rich, deep black colour that that I I think is is really lovely, and it really suits these these big bottles with these um, sort of very big gestural decoration through them. And I wondered, looking at this. Um, whether you have, because you, you're working in so many different uh, different genres, whether you you have a particular favourite, a, a favourite glaze or a favourite form, and whether you find you have to sort of um, to coax yourself away from favourites and in, into into other areas, or whether you've been working in now in so many different um, 
aspects that 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 you don't have favorites anymore or, or that they're changing maybe i think that if i was put on a desert island and i was told i could only make one form it would probably be bottles because there's such a variety of shape and form that you can yes. change them into you know this this scope is endless really um as far as Temaku is concerned, I mean, I love it too. A few years ago, Temaku completely went out of fashion. Nobody wanted it. You couldn't sell it. It was just hopeless. It's always been referred to as the potter's glaze because potters tend to love it. And, but now, for some reason, in the last, I don't know, three, four, five years, it's kind of turned full circle and come back in, in again. And people like it again for some reason. I don't know why. Um, I don't think I have, I think probably the bottle would be, there was a time when I would have said jugs. I used to enjoy making jugs. I, I, I just find now that there's a lot more variation and, and, and sort of endless scope within the bottle to bottle form. To, to, and sometimes you can make one um, and it kind of takes you by surprise. There's one in the exhibition. It's not a big one. It's a small one and it's got a little line running around it. And then I've done a sort of alternate little incis incised plant derived pattern. And I really like that pot. And it's only about six, in, seven or eight inches tall. It's not a big one at all. And it's just one that popped out of the ether, really. I mean, it's just sometimes you can plan things as much as you like. And then sometimes some thought will pop into your head just as you're about to sort of decorate it. And, and it works. Other times it doesn't work. But occasionally it just it just works, you know, and I really like that one. Um, so I probably to answer your question, I think probably bottles, you know, simply because you would never be short of somewhere to go with it. You know, there's always going to be something that you haven't done. I like the idea of desert island desert island potting. You, you, yes. You've only got one there. Uh, I've one. always had this fantasy of um, of being put onto a desert island. I don't want to do it. I mean, it, it sounds it would be awful, really. But I had this fantasy of being put on an island somewhere with nothing and told to, um, you know, make pots. Uh, and you've got to divide, you've got to find the clay, you've got to devise some way of making the glazes and make a kiln. I went, I went to an island just off South Korea a few years ago. And the kilns there, big kilns, sort of anagama type kilns, huge kilns. And they're all made with a local stone, wow. not fire brick. They put stones together to make the kiln. Gosh. What happens is the inside area of the kiln melts and that forms an almost airtight seal because the stone has melted on the inside. Wow. Yeah, I was, I was amazed. Stone kilns, yeah. And that's been happening there for oh, centuries because it was part of their sort of stoneware tradition going back to the 15th, 16th century. So, yeah. It must be quite attractive, the idea of going back to the beginning almost. When, you, when you've got to this point, when you're so established in what you're doing, the, the idea of, uh, of, of being able to start it all over again, that's, that would be a, yeah. Well, the, idea of, the idea of taking all the sort of knowledge and experience that you've got and trying to make pots out of nothing because you've got nothing. Yes. Um, that's an attractive proposition. I quite like the idea of that, you know. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't, I don't particularly want to be on a desert. <laughs> <laughs> I miss my creature comfort too much. <laughs> Thank you, Dick, for doing this. It's been lovely to, to hear your words on, on some of these lovely pots and, and to, um, to, to give some time to, to some of the ones that we didn't manage to before. So yeah, no, my you. pleasure, any time. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today. Uh, we've got a couple of really fantastic broadcasts coming up for you uh, over the weekend. On, on Sunday, we're gonna be showcasing a, a masterclass that Phil, uh, Phil Rogers uh, took here at the, at the gallery. Um, we might have expected him to do that this year, um, but unfortunately the coronavirus has, has uh, put an end to that. So that'll be an interesting blast from the past for those of you who were here. Uh, and for those of you who weren't, it'll be a, a, almost as if we were having a normal exhibition opening. 
Then on Monday, we're really excited to be uh, having a, a, a conversation between Mike Goldmark and writer and cook Nigel Slater. Uh, Nigel Slater has been a, a champion for using beautiful handmade ceramics uh, in, with uh, his home cooking. We're really looking forward to what he's got to say on Monday, so don't miss that. educate, entertain our customers. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. There's nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. Mm -hmm. 